How's it going, everyone? The OD back, and welcome to the next part of our RPG making. So in the last part, we learned about conditional branches and how to create a simple find this item, bring it to there, find that item, bring it to there sort of puzzle. And now we're going to move on to the next part, which is at the basement. And here in the basement, we will have a box pushing puzzle. And before we get into that, well, we first need to get ourselves into the basement. So I'm pretty sure you guys knew how to do that. Just right click, quick event creation, transfer. And we're going to make ourselves into the basement right there. Looking down. And then we're actually going to have to edit this about out a bit by before we transfer, we're going to tint the screen to black. Where is our blackness for the screen? Tint screen to the color black. <laughs> apply. Oopsies, we do want to hit wait. Okay, apply. Okay. And now, if we were to look into our base month, we would click here and see our cutscene. What's going to happen? Okay. So. Background music is gonna fade out. Same for the sound. Gonna wait a little bit so that the screen so it gets the feeling of a loading screen. And then play some dungeon music. Tip the screen to something that's very dark. Uh, cutscene. Blood, gross! Wait a bit. Cutscene. Man, I hope I didn't get any on me. More importantly, I can hardly see a thing. Now's a good time to bring out my handy dandy flashlight. Switch it on. Flashlight on. That's a little better. I'm not sure what exactly it is I'm looking for, but if I can find any more clues of blood, I might discover something evidence worthy. Eric's flashlight can now be used to turn on slash off by pressing page down. Well, 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 looks like we got a nifty little thing to create, aka this flashlight. But before we actually do that, let's actually check out how it works. Did you guys get that visionary vision <laughs> that kind of shows and explains to you what it is you're going to see? Such that you don't actually need a test player every single time to see what's going to happen. You just know just by reading those commands because you're a professional now and you know what's going to happen. If you did, then good job. If not, then don't worry about it. I'll take time. With the power of this crowbar, the list shall be open. I'm gonna fastly quick go through this. Seriously, I just put the shovel down. This is just maddening. There, now it's done. All that's left is to push this box aside. No surprise, it was exactly what I thought. Haha, -ha, the crowbar is in the box, and now. Blood! Gross! Man, I hope I didn't get any on me. More importantly, I can hardly see a thing here. Now's a good time to bring out my handy dandy flashlight. Ta da! That's a little better. I'm not sure what exactly it is I'm looking for, but if I can find any more clues of blood, I might discover something evidence worthy. Eric's flashlight can now be turned on and off the page down. But it's not working! Well, guess what? We're gonna have to make that. And this first test, if it it turns back, yes it does, everything looks good. Square and well. Well what do you know? It keeps playing. Well that's another thing we're gonna have to fix. But uh, down why right? We're mad geniuses. So first let's implement the flashlight. And to implement the flashlight, what we're gonna need is a common event. And the reason for that is because we want to be allowed to use this whichever map we're on. So that way once we reach a certain point. We can now turn on and off the flashlight regardless of the map. Because if we were to make it in an event, then guess what? It will only be on this map. So if we make a common event, which is now public to the entire game, once the switch is turned on, then we'll be okay. So, how about we make ourselves a flashlight? I'm going to choose section 2, just because we're going to save 0001 for the crates. But don't worry about that just yet. For now, let's worry about the flashlight. Okay, so flashlight. We're gonna have to create a switch that says flashlight. Flashlight. 
And I'm gonna say flashlight able, just because I'm strange like that. So once the flashlight is allowable to be turned on and off, we're gonna need another switch which says flashlight. And that one is gonna determine whether or not the flashlight is actually on or off. So, this is a very, 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 very simple thing to think about. So, now that we are flashlight able, meaning that we're at the point in our game where we can use a flashlight, then it's going to depend if the flashlight's on or off. If the flashlight's on, then we're going to turn the switch, flashlight, not flashlight able, but flashlight off. And then we're going to tint the screen to the color that we want it to be. And the color that we want is actually saved within here to be... Where is that tint? Right there. And since it is a flashlight and it moves at the speed of light, we're going to paste it above. It will take a fraction of a second to happen. <laughs> now. Let's look for our other tent, which is right here. Control copy. Open up our common events. Paste it here. Because now this is the flashlight that's off. However, when we turn it on, the tent effect will be that of a flashlight that's on. And then internally, we're going to tell the switch that the flashlight is now on. Now we need to bind this to a button that actually can switch it on and off. So what will we use in this case? A conditional branch for a button page down. And then we're going to take this content, control cut, and control paste. So have you guys seen the tutorial, the massive one that tore the entire engine, and I discussed about the timing of RPG Maker from one line of code to the next? If you haven't, then don't worry. I'm going to explain this again. When RPG Maker goes from one line of code to the next, it will take one fraction of a second. What that means is that this will process pretty much quicker than that. Say that the flashlight is currently off and we want to turn it on. That means it's going to go to this condition. So if we were to hit page down, then it will switch it on. However, RPG Maker moves so fast through its line of code that even though we just press it, it will return back to here and then go through this set of conditions before our finger even leaves the button. Does that make sense to you? As a visual example, check this out. Okay, are you guys ready? Page down, page down, page down. It flicks off and then flicks back on. And sometimes it'll turn off and stay off, but sometimes it will turn back on. Because remember, our RPG Maker is going so fast that it's going back to the top of the line and saying, hey, that page down is still being pressed. We, we gotta keep going, we gotta keep going. And switch the flashlight from off, back to back on. Back to back on. <laughs> back to on. So, what are we gonna have to do here? Have you guys realized it? We're gonna need a wait command. You guys are very smart. And let's assume that we remove our finger from the button within one third of a second. So that would be 20 frames. 20 frames here as well. Okay, hey guys, I got some unfortunate events. My recording actually stopped halfway through. So I am future the OD and I came in to re-record this stuff. So unfortunately what this means is that there are some future things implemented in here. I tried to copy it as accurately as possible to set us back into this time frame. However, I already finished the series and then I noticed that this clip was shorter than it should have been. And because of that, I had to jump back here and record where for some reason it just stopped recording. So what this means is that future the OD is gonna take it from here. Anyways, in our database, we last left off that our flashlight is now done. And what we're going to do now is take this and re go through it from line to line such that everything now makes sense, okay? Also, because I'm not exactly sure if I added anything in here or not. <laughs> okay, so from top to bottom, we got the sound that stops. 
and then we're gonna wait a little bit for dramatic effect okay for more for like loading effect and then we got this dungeon music going on screen returns back to a tent however it's extremely dark as you can tell by these negative 200 values um cutscenes is gonna play out it's gonna have an exclamation it's gonna step in place say blood Rose. and then he's gonna pause a little bit for one second and then look right look left right left right left to show a sort of panic Man, I hope I didn't get any on me. Then he's gonna make more balloon icons. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. That's the silence. Um, it's gonna turn right towards the entrance of the room. More importantly, I can hardly see a thing. Now is a good time to bring out my handy dandy flashlight. Turns on the flashlight. So the switch now should have auto corrected itself, I believe. Such that it's now 007. <laughs> flashlight is on. We're gonna wait a bit. That's a little better. Wait a little more, sweat some more, I'm not sure what exactly it is I'm looking for, but if I can find any more clues of blood, I might discover something evidence worthy. The sound effect of an item will play, my flashlight can now be turned on and off by pressing page down. And then we got flashlight abos on, I'm not sure if I threw this common event in there or not, but do have this event in here such that it's in the basement that way when we re-enter this basement we won't have to go through the entire cutscene again okay now your map probably looks a bit different from mine just because of these black squares are now only down here as opposed to here as well maybe I'm wrong I'm not entirely sure but if it is then just fix that up all you gotta do is look for your map go over here this square is the tile for the floor, and then just match it like mine. And I'm gonna explain this weirdness in a moment. But before that, let's not jump ahead of ourselves, let's just move on with our pacing, okay? So next up is we are going to create our crates, however, even before that, I want to finish up the flashlight. And we do have a bit more to do, and what that is is because, say we leave this map, and we go back to the outside of the back. Well, according to our script here, flashlight, guess what? We could still turn it on and off because flashlight able is now on. And when we turn it on and off, it'll tint the entire screen. And that's going to look really, really awkward when we go out here. So what we're going to have to do to prevent this is go back into our basement. And if we were to click here, open it up you would want to create a switch here and put flashlight able off, all right? This way, when he goes to interact with the stairs, he won't be able to use his flashlight anymore. And once he gets outside, he can't use his flashlight, which means that we're going to have to go in here and then put flashlight able on, okay? Okay. And you do want this conditional branch to be here just because, say, we just removed this box for the first time and we're entering the cellar for the first time. Well, hey, if they somehow push page down or they play this game and they're replaying it for a second time for some reason, <laughs> and then they wonder if they could hit page down at this point before the cutscene even begins, then they will be able to, and that will be awkward for us. So we want to have this conditional branch to ensure that the cutscene has played for the first time and then make the flashlight able on, okay? Alrighty, so now the flashlight should be pretty much up to speed and what we got left is to create our crates. And what we're gonna do for our crates is there's gonna be a few location of them. We'll call this one crate one and we're gonna have to go all the way down to the bottom. I believe it's B, look for a crate. And it's the one we're gonna use. Apply, make sure it's direction fix, and that's about it. Oh, and uncheck walking. Okay. Okay. Now, for this event, what's gonna happen, you guys? We're gonna be able to push the crate. Note that the action trigger, the trigger, sorry, is on action button. What that means is that if we want to move the crate, we have to hit space. But before that even, let's first enable a cutscene such that the player now knows that he can push crates. And we're going to do this by having Eric say, with a happy face, a happy determined face, 
<laughs> These empty crates should be easy enough for me to push. To puff. I love pine crates. <laughs> okay, sound effects, sound effects. If you type the letter P, it will jump down to the piece. Look for push. Push. Apply it. Okay, and then set movement route. This event is going to move to the right. Wait for its completion. Take this, copy, paste. Control A for control. Oh no, the H and D's is ugly. Why don't you guys tell me? God, it's like you're not even paying attention. Jesus, okay. <laughs> Go here, change that H to a lower H. Here, control, self switch on. Because we don't want this cutscene to run anymore. We'll copy, paste, tick off self switch, and then delete all of these. Okay. Now, apply. And now we're going to have to event out our event, <laughs> going out our event, okay? And the way it's going to work is very simple. So you want to push this crate by interacting with it. And say we're to its left. Well, if we're to its left, then it's going to move to its right. If we're above it, then if it was here, it's going to move down. So if you were above it, push it. Interact with it, it's going to push it down. If we're on the bottom, interact with it, it's going to push it up. If we're on the right, interact with it, it will push it left. Okay? So have you guys got an idea of how this is going to work now? So obviously this is going to need a facing direction. Conditional branch on facing direction. So if we go to page 3 and hit the player is facing down, we're going to create an else if branch and I'll explain that why later. We're going to have this event where is this event this event this event uh set movement route this event move down okay and we want to hit skip if cannot move just in case he reaches a wall that way the game won't freeze and then we also want to have this little sound effect of the push go back in page one look for it Control c for copy Control v for paste just above it hit apply and now, that's about it. <laughs> now we just got to do that for all the other facing directions. So all we got to do here is now take this, control copy, go into else, and paste. Go back here, control copy, go into this else, and paste. Go to the last one, click off, create else branch, and then put it to up. Take this one, put it to right, this one. Put it to the left. So there's an alternative way we could do this, and that is such that if we could also take this and paste it outside of this, such that it's not in the else branch, and it will work too. However, I decided to keep it in the else branch just because if you read this from the top to the bottom, then the way this RPG Maker event will execute is that it will go from here, say, hey. It's the player facing down. Assuming that the player is facing down, it'll run through this event, and then it'll skip everything in the else branch and reach the bottom. Now, if we were to have this outside of it, and the player is facing down, it would execute through this, then move on to this line, and then it will say, hey, it's the player facing left. Now, assume if all the others were like that, then it would be, hey, it's the player facing right. Hey, it's the player facing up. No, okay, we're at the bottom of the line, we're done. So, in theory, it's just that very, very slight bit faster. However, since RPG Maker reads line like the speed of light, then it honestly doesn't really matter. However, I decided to do that just because, I don't know, it's good practice, in my opinion. Okay, so there we have our event, and now we have to create this crate and put it into a few different locations, such as here here as well as a few over there and I'm not going to copy and paste the rest there and here's the reason why first of all we gotta get rid of this front page <laughs> secondly we're gonna name this crate three thirdly we're gonna name this crate two as well as delete this first page and then fourthly let's imagine and assume that we made a mistake in here 
So if we want to fix that, we would have to go to every single one of these boxes and change them manually. However, there's actually a faster way we could do this if we create a common event. And I personally already created this, but however, do not worry, do not fear, I will delete this real quick. Go into here because this is all you're going to have to do. Go to page 2, I like this, control copy, cancel this, go into here, control paste, and you're done. -da! That's all you gotta do, really guys, that's all you gotta do. Then go back to page 2, delete this, and look for our common events. Great, there we go. Okay it, we could copy this page, okay this out, go here, delete all this. Okay, so there's no point to copy the page, <laughs> we'll just do it manually. Create the common event there, take this, control C for copy, go into here, highlight, delete, paste, alrighty? So now we can copy this crate and paste it everywhere else we want to put it, which is only here. <laughs> and all we would have to do if we make an edit to this crate as a whole, we would just edit it here. And the reason why this is a lot faster and more preferred is because say we don't have just four of these events, say we had 20 of them and we made an error in one of them, which means we made an error in all of them. So rather than going through every single one of these and changing it manually, we'll just have to go up here until I create common event and then alter it here and then it'll fix itself. It's all automatic and it's very, very nice. Okay, so looking at this puzzle now, you guys are probably wondering, Okay, so are we gonna talk about this black thing now? No. And the reason for that is because I want to show you guys exactly how this map or how this box push puzzle is solved. And what we're going to do is take this crate, push it here. Take this crate, push it here. Take this crate, push it here. Take this crate, crate, push it here. Go over here, take that crate and push it there. Take this key and put it into this door and go on to the next map. That's how you solve this map. And so if you were to follow my mouse instead, we would go boom, 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 boom. And then when this crate gets here, we're actually gonna hop over, then go all the way here. And that's how we solve it, okay? So now what we're going to do is figure out how to make the player jump over the box when this crate gets over here. Well, the first thing I want to do is actually change the graphics of this box personally, because you can't really jump on top of a empty box. Well, I guess you could jump on the side, but let's make it look more visually appealing, okay? By changing it to that. All right. So next we got to see if the crate has hit upon that location. And can you guys guess what we're going to do with that? And the answer is rather obvious. It's rather simple because we've seen something like this before. We're going to use a set of variables. The set of variables is going to be set to the crate's current coordinates as it gets pushed along. And it has to equal the spot exactly. So if we take this and then we go here, we're actually going to do two variables. I believe I created this along with a bunch of others. Feel free to ignore the others and just think about what we have with ourselves already. And I believe this one's going to be temp x and temp y. So temp x is obviously going to equal the x variable of this crate, game data, character, this map x, this event map x I mean. Hit apply, take this, control copy, control paste space to edit, create a temp y, and then this will be the map y of this event. Okay, does that look good? Makes sense. Okie dokie. So next up, we're going to have to ensure that the player has moved it to this spot. Remember these coordinates, 912, okay? So 912. We're going to create two conditional branches, and we're going to see if temp x is equal to 9. Hit else, take this, copy, 
paste it inside here, this one. I'm going to take to y and make sure that it equals to, what was it, 12 or 13? I've already forgotten. 12, okay. So, what this says is, hey, is the x coordinate of the crate equal to 9? And then it's going to ask, hey, if the y coordinate equals to 12? If so, player will be able to hop over. If not, then that's where we take this and then go into the else branches and paste it in there. Hit apply, and we're pretty much Gucci. Okay, so now we're gonna say, hmm, we want the player to hop over the box, and what we're going to do now is create the move, set movement route. <laughs> that was totally butchered. Set movement route, okay? So now the player is here. The box has been pushed here. And the player is here. And he's going to hop over. Minus 1. Minus 1. Minus 1 minus 1. Minus 1 plus 1. Minus 1 plus 1. And in case you didn't know what I meant by that. Keep your eyes on this. This is the x and this is the y. When I say minus 1 minus 1. The first minus 1 is the x. And the second minus 1 is the y. Okay. So it's going to be from here. And he's going to hop on here. That's minus 1, minus 1. As you can tell, it changed minus 1. So it's going to go here. See? Went from 9 to 8 and 11 to 10. And then minus 1 plus 1, 7 to 11. 7 to 11. And then it's going to go minus 1 plus 1, 6, 12. Okay, is that easy peasy lemon squeezy? So, we go back here, hit space. We're going to be jumping. Minus 1, minus 1. Dashy. Take this, copy, paste, 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 go into this one, and go to plus one, space, plus one, apply, and okay. So say after each hop, we make the player wait a little bit. So he's going to hop here, pause, then hop here, sorry, pause, then hop here, pause, then hop here, pause. And the reason I want to do that is because right now there's no weight in between, so he's just gonna go like this. <laughs> and that's weird, okay? So, yeah, that was weird. <laughs> so, we're actually gonna go here, and in between each and every one of these, we're gonna do play sound effect, and he's gonna play the sound effect of the jump. That's good. as well as weight in between each jump. That's what I was talking about at first. So additionally, we want to put the sound effect of the jump. <laughs> and he's going to do a one second weight in between. No, no, no. He's going to do 30 for this one. Then it's going to do hop to the top. And then from the very top peak to the bottom one, he's going to wait one second. Then this one's going to be 30 seconds. Alrighty. Okay, so if we were to visually look at this and compare it to our balls, try to make sure it doesn't go over the border. The player is going to be here in this tile here. Then he's going to make that jump sound effect. Jump here, wait 30 frames. Jump here, wait 60 frames. Jump down here, 30 frames. Jump here, and he's good to go. Now, Next question is, why do I have these? These is weird, like, craziness. Yes, why? Okay, and the reason for that is because when you create this jump, the player will actually, for a second, face under these crates and then over. And in case you don't believe me and you think I'm crazy, here's what I mean. We're gonna take this, put it here, take this, Put that there, and then take these two, put it here, and then this one there. Okay. So we're going to test play it, and you guys are going to see exactly what I mean. Okay, so I made my way into the basement, the cutscene is just about to end. Let's first test our flashlight. Make sure we cannot use it in this room, but we could use it in this room. Okay, everything still looks good. Now we're going to push this crate. Oh no, we cannot push it because I set their priorities awkwardly. Okay, so we're going to go back here, and we're going to change this below to same, then go here to same, 
And then for these boxes, they actually didn't appear. And the reason for that is because the soft switch was still on. I forgot to turn it off. I'm sorry. My bad. Don't yell at me. I'm quite sensitive at yelling. <laughs> then put that on same. Take this off. Go to here. Same. Take this off. Okay. Control S to save. Okay. Now we should be able. Yahoo! These empty sit traits <laughs> should be easy enough for me to push. Oh my god. First it was these, and now it's citrates. Did I forget to do that one too? Oh my god. And that thing just like awkwardly bugged out. Okay, so we have a few that we gotta do, don't we? Alright, so let's go back into here. Change citrates to crates. See, you guys weren't paying attention at all. You didn't say a single thing. Oh my god. Okay, go back to the database. And here's the error. They're all set to move down when they should be set to their corresponding movement pattern. So this one should be move right. This should be these facing right. It'll move right. This right, 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 right. And I know I made a mistake here. Face left should move left. Delete the first one. And then the bottom one, if he's facing up, move up. Okay. Apply. And now, see what I need? When you make a mistake, it'll all auto-fix itself. And everything looks okay there. Control S, Control R, and this should be it. Now we're back here, and hopefully he won't say the traits. He will say crates. Good, he said crates. Alright, now. So alone, the crates are being pushed. Now we're gonna go all the way here. And then hop over. Are you ready for this magic? Why aren't you working? <laughs> okay, let's double check with things. Okay, so the reason why they weren't working is if you look here, this is event 1, I mean variable 1, this is variable 10, and then this one's variable 9 and variable 10. Okay, so that makes sense. I'm just gonna put these back to variable 1 here and then variable 2 here. I feel like 9 and 10 is actually used later on in the next map and because of that I do not want to confuse it. We're able to use 1 and 2 again even though we previously used it because we're not going to go back on that map ever again. Okay, So that's why it's okay to reuse our variables 1 and 2. It does not affect this game. I mean it does not affect this point onward for this game. And now Control S, Control R, it should work. So guys, when it comes down to naming things, name it better. <laughs> Do not name it like I name it. Name it better. Page up for flashlight. Page down, I mean. Okay, now if we push this box all the way to the end over here, it will work out. And just to prove it, go! Haha! -ha. So that was what I was talking about. You saw that cutoff? If you didn't, then rewind it and rewatch the video. So, there's another thing I do want to do here. I do want to edit this and say hop over. Didn't have a yes, no sort of choices. Yes or no. Take this, cut, paste it there, and then that's it. So now he has the player has a choice to hop over. If yes, he'll hop over. If no, he will just leave, and then nothing will happen. <clears throat> okay, so the next question is, why did it clip over when the player was hopping over? <laughs> and the reason for that is not with our events, not with our coding, but the properties of the map. And if we go back to tile sets, and which one is this set under? 9, index 9. Go to map index 9. We will see in B that these have their priority such that it will always be above the player. And what that means is that even though the player is here, the box will be over them. And I know what you're thinking. Okay, just turn off that priority, right? Well, wrong. Because when the player walks from here all the way over here, we do not want the player to have that that he is now above the box. Instead, we want to make sure that the box 
is appropriate to the position of the player. Meaning that when the player is hopping over, you want the box under the player. But when the player is here and walking over, you want the box above the player. Okay? So, to re-show that example, in case that was a bit confusing, it was a little confusing for me. Okay, so, remember the clipping. Clips. And now that we're on this side, we actually want it to look like this because that looks more natural, am I right? However, when he hops over, we want the box under the player. Okay, so what we're going to do here is that we can actually control these sorts of priorities using events. And if you remember, priority is right here. So, what we're going to do now is customly create our boxes to have the images of to customly create, yeah, customly create our boxes to have the images of those boxes. I, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> and at first it's gonna be below, so we can actually copy this, paste it here, paste it there, paste it, do we also put it here too? Yep, paste it there. Oopsies, paste it there. And now we're actually gonna take this and make sure that the images are appropriate to what they're expected to be. Okay, and now we want to change what they look like because remember they're still under tiles So we want to actually remove a few of them. <laughs> Remove a few of them So we're gonna look for this tile here Go back to our editor and go over it. So as you can tell If you look at these three, they're now faded out such that it's no longer there And then for this one, we actually want to go to this one and put it here okay so what's next is to now figure out when the player is hopping over versus when the player is just walking across of it and it's actually very simple all you're gonna do is come here and say when they choose yes for hopping over we're gonna turn on a switch and that switch is going to be called hopping over make sure to write it in hopping over then okay it out turn that on then after the hop we want to make sure that we turn it off okay and each and every one of these you want to copy paste it turn on the switch hopping over make sure that this one is below and our initial one is above so go to the next one copy the page paste it below switch is hopping over then page one is above then go to this one and copy, paste, make sure it's below, switch is hopping over. And then page one, priority is above. Then we're gonna go to this one, <laughs> copy the page, paste it, and then go to priority, make sure it's below. And then go to condition, make sure it says hopping over. Okay, now page one, look at it, make sure it's above. <laughs> was that confusing <laughs> okay so now if we were to test play this out it should work out the way we expect it to okay here it is you guys doot, doot. there we go there we go and it all worked out fine ain't that cool eh now what we got to the left is this is personal for me. I feel like the player should continue looking to the left as he hop over to the left and then continue looking right when he hops over to the right, which we actually got an event as well. So, and so before we get ahead of ourselves, let's just go here. Once you hop over, make sure he's looking left every single time after every single one of those jumps. as opposed to facing up and then facing down as he jumped. Okay, now that looks pretty good. Control S to save. Now we're gonna take this, copy it and paste it here because we want this part here. And we also want this part here. So we're gonna highlight those and then hit Control X for cut. Go here, delete all of this, Control V for paste. And then now we gotta edit our jump, cuts. 
He's no longer jumping to the left, he's now jumping to the right. And what is it in terms of our coordinates? He's now going to go plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So basically, the only thing that's opposite is our x on our jump. So that's now plus one, plus one, plus one, and plus one. Okay, okay, control S, control R. Continue and test playing it out. And here we go. Ah, he's facing the left. That's so awkward. <laughs> so just remember to change that too. Make sure he's facing to the right side this time. And then other than that, we know that it works and it's all good. So turn right, turn right, turn right, and turn right. Okay. Apply. Okay. So there's something I forgot to mention to you guys. Go back into here and where you see this part, make sure you turn the flashlight off as well. We we don't want to make any sorts of complications, okay? So just do that and then yours will be exactly the same as mine. Okay, now moving forward and continue where we left off. So now that the player is here, he should be able to reach this key here. And because this is future DOD, remember, I already created this key and you guys have it. Now you guys are going to have to create your own key. I'm not sure if you need to create your own sparkle, but in the substitution that you need to create your own sparkle, just Remember, we already made a sparkle, so I don't need to tell you. Yeah, guys, make the sparkle if you need to. And then just have a key. Maybe this will go to the door. Sound effect of the key. Eric, contain the key. And then add a key. So I'll switch A. This is so switch A. So it's just, such that it's no longer there. So if we were going to add our key, we're going to go to our database, go to our items, and then look for the hole here, type in key change the image to that of a key it's right here in the blue section and then a description have fun with that and then for this the item type you want to put it on regular item and yes you can put it on key item but later on we're going to change our rpg makers menu such that we can no longer see key items and that only regular items will appear i'll show you that in a second don't worry so we're going to change the consumable to no such that when the player tries to use it it will not disappear out of your inventory because we consumed it like we would consume a potion uh you can leave the scope to whatever it is we're going to change the occasion to never such that the player can no longer use the item the rest you can ignore because all of these is just for battle implementations common events etc and etc which we do not need to pay attention to, okay? So hit OK there, go back to here. In case this is not here yet, you're going to double click, change item, look for key, increase, constant one, and then it will appear, okay? And that's how that works. Now, we're nearing the end of this tutorial. Stop that recording. Future the OD messed up, but don't you worry, cause future picture the OD is here to fix things. <laughs> okay, so future the OD then actually messed up. He just forgot something in his re-recording. So future future the OD is here with his re-recording -re to fix things, amongst other things. <laughs> That's a lot of things. You know, if you say re-re-recording really fast, it kind of sounds like wee wee recording. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are gross. Okay, so. What I wanted us to continue on with was, say we leave the map, and then we come back, and then the boxes teleport back to the location that they were found. And we can't do that, because if we try to come from here and make our way down here, we will actually push that box there, and it will be stuck forever. So tell me guys, how do we keep the boxes in the locations that they were pushed to once the puzzles has been solved? And to be honest, you guys actually already know this, because if you go back to outside back, and you go over to here, you can find your solution right there. Yeah. You can also find your solution right here. Yeah, and do you guys remember where we installed those variables? Well, 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 we installed them right here. So do you guys got an idea of how this will work? Because that's going to be part of your homework. 
That's right. And you got a lot of homework. That's also right. Because not only will you have to make the boxes saved in the location that they're pushed to. I'm actually going to give you a hint on this. So, you're actually going to put the solved location, I mean the variable of their solved location, in here. Ba -da -ba -ba. Now, where are you going to put the moon? set event location aka not that one this one where are you going to put this huh where are you going to put that and what are you going to put inside of that that's the question and the next question is do you guys know the answer well solve it for yourself the next thing i want you guys to do is to go through this make sure you test play it and Figure out how it works, figure out what you need, and then in the next part, I'm actually going to tell you how to solve out this door so that it's 100% ugly dugly. And then go into here, watch the cutscene, figure things out, and then go over here, open this. You don't have to study this one just yet because we're going to go through this together step by step and then at the end of that video I'm going to tell you to make sure that you learn everything from here 100% okay so to be honest it's actually pretty easy um, it's really short if you, because you're just gonna read this get an idea of how it works figure that out uh, but what I want you guys to be able to do for this door if you guys want a head start of the next video we're going to make it so that once you go through this door, you won't be able to turn on and off your flashlight when you're in this room. And the reason you want to do this is because the story goes that this room has no windows in it and there's no source of light. So Eric wants to leave his flashlight on when he gets into this room. But when he goes back into this room, he should still be able to turn that flashlight on and off. Does that sound cool? Can you guys manage that? If not, don't worry, we're going through that in the next part. However, the crates, that's all on you. I am not going to go through it because I believe in you guys. Other than that, if you guys want to go above and beyond, then in your own test file, create your own flashlight and uh, create your own... Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Get creative, create your own common event, sorte, so that you understand it. If you feel like you already understand it as it is, because it's a very simple comp set, then congratulations, you guys are good. You don't have to test yourself out on that. But say you're a little bit confused on it, then do study it back here. Do study it back in your test file by creating something of your own. And then just, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Alright guys, this is Future Future The Odie saying keep RPG. I'll see you in the next part where we start to decode things as well as finish up this door here. But for the last thing, be sure to compliment past The Odie. He sure likes compliments. But then again, it's Future 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 The Odie that's going to read the comments. So be sure to compliment Future 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 The Odie. He likes things. <laughs> Alright, I'll see you guys in the next part. And then guys, ciao! It's such that the player has to decipher Braille. Take Braille, turn it into letters, and take those letters, and depending on what position it is in the alphabet, that will equate this number. So, if you have been realizing these little circles that I told you to ignore for now and come back to later, that's what it is. This thing here, this is actually in Braille. If you hit preview, you would see this. This dialogue, the top part of the dialogue.